before. Uh, Welcome to the uh, second part uh, of the Block Cipher Quick Analysis uh, session. Uh, now we will have the presentation of uh, the paper Efficient Detection of High Probability Statistical Properties of uh, Crypto Systems via Surrogate Differentiation uh, by Itai Nur, Or Dunkelman, Nathan Keller. Eyal Ronan and Adi Shamir, and the talk is uh, given by Or. Oh. Thank you very much, Henry. Uh, so this is a, a joint work with Itai and Nathan and Eyal and Adi. I'm not going to repeat the title because we're on a short uh, schedule. Uh, just to give things in context, uh, I'm going to give a very short preliminary introduction, which I'm not sure that people in this audience need, but so we'll have the same basic uh, definitions. Then we're going to speak very quickly about how to find diff differentials and differential characteristics. And then and we're going to show you our results. So let's start. Uh, a block cipher is a family of uh, permutations from n bits to n bits. Uh, and what I'm discussing now, I'm going to present it in for permutations. It works the same for functions from n bits to n bits. And usually we use these block ciphers. We assume that they are secure or ideal or strong under some uh, definitions. And these definitions are actually saying this block cipher looks random enough. Now, depending on your definition of uh, security, looks and random and enough are things which are for you to decide. Um, and specifically, uh, if we try to evaluate the security of a block cipher, what we do, we try to show that these assumptions fail. Right? We're trying as adversaries or as attackers to use one of the attacks, for example, differential cryptanalysis or linear cryptanalysis, and actually uh, show weaknesses in the cipher. So a very quick recap, we already seen this of differential cryptanalysis introduced by Biamin Shamir in 1990, and it studies the development of differences through the encryption function. So we have an encryption function, usually it contains rounds, and there is a differential characteristic, which is a prediction of differences, how they evolve throughout the encryption. And if, you, if the round functions or the components are linear, we know how differences evolve. If these are nonlinear operations, then you start to look at probabilities. So, so far, you all know that. And just as a, something to keep at the back of our minds, that usually we care about the probability of the differential. We just care about the input output difference and their probability. It's just that usually we have good tools to find characteristics. So we find characteristics, and we assume that this is a lower bound on the probability of the differential because, well, this is the case. Now, uh, how to do this for a nonlinear function? So the basic method is to use difference distribution tables. I will show you in a second how a DDT looks, uh, looks like. Uh, so it counts just many how, how many input-output pairs satisfy some differential transitions. In some variants of the attack, you will also find the pairs themselves, the values themselves. And this is a very uh, important part in identifying high probability transitions because you need to, first of all, look at the nonlinear transitions and find things which happen with high probability. Um, and anything that I'm going to say now is also applicable to ARX ciphers, where usually you don't construct the DDT itself, but you have some way to approximate or sample high probability uh, entries or the entries that you're interested in. So here is, for example, the difference distribution of S1 from DES. So you can see the input difference, the output difference, and you look for the high probability transitions. So how do you find differential characteristics usually? Uh, there is an exponential number of characteristics, right? Start an input difference. You can try all possible uh, paths, trails, characteristics, actually, going from the input to the output. And you try to find the one with the best probability. Uh, so there are several works. There are actually a lot of works trying to find these characteristics. Uh, and they usually use the bottom-up approach. The bottom-up approach, give or take, you find a good one-round characteristics. And then you try to concatenate them. And you either do it using uh, some intuition or uh, greedy approaches. So in the beginning, it, everything was greedy approaches. Then there was some pruning of BFS searches, if you know Matsui's uh, algorithm. And of course, today we use automatic tools like SAT solving or MILP or constraint programming or any of these tools that actually you throw everything into the solver. And the solver gives you, here is a characteristic. Now, I, I just want to point one thing, is that these tools are very hard to verify. 
I, we just seen some uh, claims about Speedy saying, oh, the authors found the, a bound on the, the probability of the differential, and therefore they assume that things cannot happen. But even then, if you use MILP solvers or SAT solvers or, or any of these to prove that there is no characteristic or that your characteristic is optimal, you need to formally verify this thing, which is a bit hard with those tools, if you know what I mean. Now, there are some works to try to do it in a top-down approach. Uh, we had a paper with Itai and Adi and a student of uh, Adi in 2015 where we tried to find iterative differentials and they're very important, but these are not very common. Now, some problems with the bottom-up approach, as I mentioned before. Uh, first of all, if you have a very complicated function, for example, in ARXs, the reason that we don't do DDTs for large additions, for large word additions, is that constructing the DDT takes time 2 to the 2n, and it's very uh, time consuming. So usually, what people are doing, they're looking at only specific transitions, but then you may, you may miss some good transitions, so this is also not good. Uh, another problem which happens a lot is that if you concatenate one round characteristics, uh, and this also comes out from automatic tools, they might not be consistent with each other. If you look down very, uh, very thoroughly, you may find actually transitions that contradict each other, and this is, was known, as, it, it's very common in boomerangs, but it also exists in differential and linear cryptanalysis. And this dependency actually can alter the probability up to zero, meaning that the characteristic that you worked with actually has zero probability, or the differential that you worked with has probability zero, and then you have a very nice paper, but it doesn't work. And uh, something to, to note, it's actually if you have a differential, it takes only order of one over p to test it if the probability is p, but it's only if the differential is known. So even if you have a characteristic and you try to verify it, you're going to get the probability of the differential and it might not be related at all to the characteristic that you have in mind. So here's the problem statement, what we're trying to solve. We're given a function from n bits to n bits. And we want to find the highest entries of the difference in solution table. And starting from this point onwards, I of, cor I of course disregard all the trivial, I mean, the trivial entry of zero goes to zero. It's not that interesting. So that would be nice if we could find all the entries which have probability larger than p. And there are several trivial solutions. The first one is to construct the difference in solution table. As I mentioned before, it takes time 2 to the 2n. Now n is the block size or the input size. And there is this different approach which says take all the input differences and for each input difference encrypt 1 over p or ask for the encryption of order of 1 over p pairs and look if you see some output difference that appears uh, very commonly so it takes time 2 to the n over p. Very simple and trivial algorithms they're just completely impractical for even 64-bit ciphers. So we decided to look at something that looks very weird which is surrogate differentiation. So actually what we look at, we look for alpha and beta such that f of x, x or fx, x or alpha is equal to beta. This is the thing that we're looking for and we don't know alpha. So we, we cannot compute the derivative of f at alpha, which is what we're trying to do. Instead of that, we just compute it in a random direction. Now at this point of time, I'm just going to define, here's the de derivative g of uh, gamma of x, which is fx, x or fx, x or gamma. And now at this point of time, you should ask, but if I'm trying to find the maximal en entry of the difference distribution table, and it has some alpha and beta associated with it, why are you differentiating in a random direction? This doesn't make any sense. Those in favor, raise your hands. Those opposing, those who fell asleep. Okay, great. If you fell asleep, how did you raise your hand? <laughs> okay. So here's the reason. Now, I'm terribly sorry because we're going, assume you have a 3D screen, okay? So let's assume for a second that both x, so I remind you that we have a differential, alpha goes to beta. So that means that x and x, x or alpha, when you, they go through the function f, they become y and y, x or beta. The problem is that I don't know alpha. I remind you what I did, or what we did. We took x, and we took x, x, or gamma, and we asked them to go through the function. So we got y and y, x, y prime. However, if by chance both x and x, x, or gamma are right pairs 
uh, part of right path with respect to the differential alpha goes to beta, then with very good probability, y prime is going to be related to y prime x or beta. I remind you this. If the difference here is gamma, the difference here is alpha. So this is alpha uh, x, x or alpha x or gamma, which is just gamma di uh, alpha difference uh, between these two, alpha difference between these two. So we get the beta difference between these two, beta difference between these two. That actually means if you do all the calculations and you count everything, that the x of these two things is the x of these two things. Those of you who got confused, raise your hands. Those of you who fell asleep, raise your hands. Ah, you already learned. Good. So actually, if by chance these two pairs are right pairs with respect to the characteristic that, or the differential that we're trying to find, then we're, we're going to get a collision. So here is the algorithm, the basic algorithm. The probability of this event is p squared. So you collect 2 to the n over p squared quartets for a random gamma. We just compute random derivative at a random direction, and that's it. We, in each collision, if you look at the collision, it will also offer you values for alpha and beta, and then you just verify them. So luckily for us, we can use the birthday paradox. I mean, you can take many pairs, and then you find square, root, uh, square number of uh, quartets. So the ti data time and memory required is about 2 to the n over 2 over p. So for 64-bit block cipher, you can actually find differentials with high probability. It's, it's reasonable. You just need a bit of memory. Uh, and actually, the algorithm produces all differentials with, differentials with probability p. Now, there is some discussion in the paper, and I urge you to read it, about why we take slightly more data and what are the randomness assumptions for the algorithm to work. There are some randomness assumptions. Some of them make the algorithm work slightly less good, and some of them actually increases a bit the time complexity. So there are some, of course, some improvements. Obviously, when we try to find collisions, automatically you should go, oh, I'm finding collisions. Let's do memory-less collision search. We can do that. Oh, we can do memory-less memory -less collision search. Let's do parallel collision search. We can do that as well. Um, so you can see the paper for details. And another thing is that now that you know this wonderful technique, you can design your cipher to be secure against that, meaning you're going to hide a differential in your design. And then you can build your cipher in such a way that all the right pairs, for example, come from a very limited set of values, and then our algorithm may fail. Luckily, we have a way to deal with that. Okay? So the robust algorithm is given in the paper, so you can see the, uh, the algorithm itself. It's very similar. The basic idea is very similar. It's just that the analysis is more uh, thorough and more, of course, uh, rigorous. Uh, the time complexity actually doesn't change by much. So I remind you that earlier it was 2 to the n over 2 time over p. Now it's over p to the power of 3 over 2. There is a, a small story. caveat here is that this assumes that there are not that many hidden uh, differentials. But if you're going to hide many high probability differentials in your design, well, the running, running time of our algorithm is not your only problem. OK? So this is about the worst case scenario. Now let's quickly go over the linear uh, case. We can also do it for a linear function. I'm not going to introduce linear cryptanalysis. Everybody knows cri linear cryptanalysis? Yeah, give or take. Yeah, you find linear approximation between input and output. And of course, everything I said about differential cryptanalysis also holds here. How do we build linear approximations from the input to the output? OK, we, we concatenate one round linear approximations. Or we use MILP tools. Or we, and some of you may use correlation matrices, so you don't have dependency issues. But those of you using correlation matrices, you raise your hands. There is some help outside. Seek it. Um, no, no, it's not seriously. There is no help outside. Uh, so everything I said about finding linear approximations is, is true here. And actually, it's even worse. Because in linear, in linear cryptanalysis, unless you work with correlation matrices, which is impossible for very large uh, block sizes, the dependencies are, they, they have a greater impact on the output or on the probability or the bias of the approximation. In differential cryptanalysis, each new characteristic just adds to the probability. In linear cryptanalysis, if you don't use correlation matrices, it can go up or go down each new characteristic approximation. So here's the problem. We want to find all the entries of the LAT, which has a bias which is larger than epsilon. And of course, the trivial solution is to 
construct the linear approximation table. It takes time n times 2 to the 2 n using uh, Francois Xavier's uh, FFT trick. Uh, another option is to define for each mask, either of the input or the output, but let's do it with the output. Uh, you define a function which is beta times f of x, so looking at the mask of the output. And for each mask, you're running goldreich levine algorithm to find all the alpha such that the Fourier trans the discrete Fourier transform of f beta of alpha is actually very high. So you can use goldreich levine goldreich levine is a method to find uh, bi biases in uh, random functions. So the time complexity you're going to get, you, you see it's very similar to the 2 to the n um, that we had before. So you try all betas and then p minus 2 coming from the goldreich levine uh, or you can use LPN approaches, actually. Learning parity with noise are very much useful here. It's just that it's very hard when the bias decreases. So if you, f if you solve linear cryptanalysis, you solve LPNs. So we are, you are now all experts in solving LPNs. Congratulations. Um, so the main problem is that we don't know alpha and beta. So no matter how you work around that, uh, you need to iterate over one of them. So we want to eliminate alpha. And we do that using surrogate differentiation. So first of all, just to make sure, we have alpha times x equals to beta times f of x, uh, and the bias is p. Um, so here's the trick. Apparently, when you differentiate a function which has a bias, alpha to beta in the mask, what you get is an approximation from zero bias to the output of g. So actually, we took a biased function, or a biased permutation, f may be a permutation, Usually it's a permutation. And by using the surrogate differentiation, we make the input, the input mask disappear. You want me to do the math? Yeah, I thought so. Nobody said yes. So trust me, it works all the details in the paper. Okay. Oh. But the thing is that you get zero goes to beta. So if you just look at G of gamma, you get an output mask which is biased. There is a bias in the function G. There is a bias in the function g. Let's find it using. You didn't expect questions at this time, right? Goldreich Levine. So here's the intuition. I'm not going to do the full analysis again, full analysis in the paper, full details in the paper. First of all, we use surrogate differentiation, no more alpha. Huge success. Then what we're doing, we're finding n over 2 plus the upper bits of beta and n over 2 minus uh, plus the bits of the lower part of beta. So actually, what we do, we look at the uh, partial function that looks at, uh, goes to n over 2 plus t bits and n over 2 plus 2 lower bits. Okay, so in each of them we find masks which are uh, with bias. Great. Now we store in the table everything and we find, of course, the intersection of the two t bits. So there is extra t bits from here, extra t bits from there, and we find values which appear on both lists. So we get something like the list of uh, possible beta values. And for each of these betas, we find the corresponding alpha, because now we know we eliminated one of the problems. So if you want, you can go and run the attack or the algorithm on the other side and find alphas. The paper again does it in a bit more elaborate way. It doesn't change a lot the complexity. So here's the summary of the results. Uh, finding Differentials we can do in 2 to the n over 2 p minus 1, also over p. Data in memory, of course, you can do it with a mem memory optimized version using parallel collision search or memory less. If you insist, there is a small payment to pay here because of technicalities. Did I mention that you can see all the technical details in the paper? You can see all the technical papers, in, all, the, all the technical details in the paper and the worst case assumption. We can, of course, do also linears. This is the analysis. If you wonder why, what is this t, the t is chosen such that you get this complexity. We can also find boomerangs. We can also find second order differentials and related key differentials. And we find the differentials, not differential characteristics. We know the alpha and the beta, and we don't know what is the characteristic that took this input difference to this output difference. We don't care. So to summarize, we have uh, presented new efficient algorithms for finding statistical properties. Uh, it's a top-down approach, so I guess that it's going to be useful in uh, other cases as well. Uh, there, are, there may be some problems with key dependencies. This is throughout all the tools that you work with. The thing is that 
in many of our algorithms, you can just plug in in some of the places different keys and nothing would change. So you can actually test many keys simultaneously. And unless there is only a small wiki class which was designed, that there's really small wiki class hiding somewhere, we can still find everything. So, but if you have a very small wiki class, what the probability of you hitting it by chance? So that's of a problem. Uh, for differential cryptanalysis, actually our algorithms are almost uh, optimal, meaning there we can show or argue a lower bound of 2 to the n over 2, square root 1 over p. Not 1 over p, square root of 1 over p. For linear cryptanalysis, it doesn't work. Uh, and one thing to remember, these algorithms are much simpler to, to verify. Yes, the algorithms, one of the algorithms, the linear approximation one is like one page of pseudocode. But once you have this framework, you just plug in the algorithm that you're trying to attack, and that's it. With that, I will thank you for your attention. If you have questions, raise your hand. Okay. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I didn't uh, fall asleep. So uh, I wonder what happens in a worst case where the f when the function is such that by some chance uh, gamma that you selected doesn't make x and x plus gamma in a, in a good pair. So in, in the differential cryptanalysis uh, case, we have the worst case algorithm because we try different gammas. This is the way to counter that. And because we try enough gammas, so there is an area, there is a space or area or set of good pairs, good values with respect to the differential. And because we test enough gammas, you can show that essentially we're going to hit one of them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. will it to the paper finding the impossible automated search for full impossible differential zero correlation and integral attacks uh, by Hossein Adipur, Sadeg, Sadegi and Maria Eichel Zeder uh, and the talk is uh, given by Hossein Adipur. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Hossein Adipur from Graz University of Technology and I'm very pleased to present our paper entitled Automated Search for Full Impossible Differential Zero Correlation and Integral Attacks, which is a joint work with of Sadari and Maria Ashley-Sedder. <coughs> By full, I mean we find the whole attack, the key recovery attack, not only the distinguisher part. Long story short, um, in this work, uh, when we started this work, there was not a tool to find the entire attack. Most of the previous tools were focused, uh, many of them were focused on finding only the distinguisher. So to achieve this goal, we first introduced a new CP-based uh, method to find the distinguisher, but the difference between this method and the previous ones was that uh, it can be extended to a unified method for key recovery. So we, to show, uh, we actually created it, and to show its usefulness, we applied it to some AS like, like Cypher, such as a skinny craft, and some extended versions of a skinny, and we got a series of significantly improved results. This table just showed um, a part of results, for example, we improved the integral attack on a skinny by three rounds in some variants. We improved the zero correlation attack by one and two rounds in some cases. We improved the time complexity of impossible differential attack, for example, for this variant of a skinny by a factor of two to the 20. What is not represented in this table is that all of these results can be found by our tool in a few seconds, five or four seconds on a regular laptop, which, uh, which represents the efficiency of our tool. So uh, this is my plan for the rest of this talk. First, I will briefly review the background of impossible differential attack. Uh, I only focus on impossible differential attack in this presentation. I don't want to s talk about zero correlation and integral attacks. You are very welcome to refer to the paper regarding the, the two other attacks. I only give you the overall view of our method for impossible differential attack. 
And then I will tell you how we find a distinguisher and then uh, explain how we extend this model for a unified uh, key recovery model. And I will conclude the talk by pointing to some future works in this direction. So um, this is a skinny, um, uh, one of the applications of our tool. Uh, Eskini was uh, introduced in Crypto 2016. It's a family of two equal black ciphers. It's really as skinny as you can see in this linear layer. And uh, as far as I know, it has six main variants, depending on its block size, which can be 64 or 128 bits. And the size of Twiki, it has uh, uh, six main variants. And three of them, as far as I know, has been, have been standardized. So this is the round function of Peskini, which is not, rep uh, what is not represented in this shape is the key, the tweaky schedule of Peskini, which is linear. I skipped it in this shape. It's a linear and uh, it includes uh, some LFSRs in each uh, 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 cell pass and it applies, uh, it applies a permutation on the position of these nibbles. It's essentially linear, the tweaky schedule. Yeah, this is a skinny. Most of the examples in my slides are rely on this uh, cipher. Let's review uh, the basics of impossible differential attack. An impossible differential attack, which was introduced in late 90s, um, we exploit an impossible differential transition to distinguish the block cipher from a random permutation. And then we put this distinguisher in the middle, and just like many other statistical attacks, we extend it backward and forward, and we build a key recovery upon this distinguisher. Uh, how the key recovery works, it's a very uh, brief uh, uh, description of key recovery. We first create a pool of pairs that satisfy this delta B and delta F. Delta B and delta F could be truncated differentials, could be set of differences. They are not essentially fixed differences. We first create a pool of pairs that satisfy this delta B and delta F, and then we guess the involved keys to do partial encryption and decryption and to reach to the input and output of distinguisher and we check the property of distinguisher, which is this impossible differential transition. And in this case, even if for one pair, uh, the key suggests the impossible differential attack, the, the impossible differential transition, we make sure that this key is wrong. We discard it, we put it aside, and we try another key. The core idea is discarding as many wrong keys as possible in this guess and filter step. And then uh, at the end of this step, we are left with some candidates, right? <laughs> and some keys are not involved in the attacks. So we do a brute force over the remaining space of key to uniquely retrieve the master key. This is the overall view of key recovery. So. Uh, some questions here. First of all, how we find a distinguisher? And what is the complexity of this attack? I will answer these questions uh, in the next slides. Let's uh, start by the first part. How we find the distinguisher, this impossible differential transition? Uh, the core idea in the seminal paper of uh, impossible differential attack by, uh, as far as I remember, Birikov, uh, Biham, and Shamir in late 90s, uh, was missed in the middle technique. According to this, uh, to this technique, uh, you find two differences such that when you propagate them forward and backward with probability one, they contradict each other in the middle. This way you can confirm that, okay, this difference at the input never goes to this di difference at the output. This differential transition is impossible, right? Let me give you an example. Assume uh, this is six rounds of Eskini. Assume that we represent the zero uh, difference with white cells. We represent non-zero differences, any non-zero differences with red cells, and we represent unknown differences with blue cells. If you choose this input pattern and this output pattern, and you propagate them with probability one, let's propagate them further, you will see that at the meeting point, they contradict each, each other because this cell here should be non-zero based on the lower trail, and at the same time, it should be zero based on the upper trail. This is some sort of contradiction, and it's a uh, conference that, okay, if you choose this pattern at the input and this pattern at the output, you have an impossible differential distinguisher, right? But um, 
this method is uh, some sort of confirmation. You're, 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 and when I give you the in input and output pattern, you can confirm my claim. It doesn't tell you how to find it. That was the motivation of many previous works to create an algorithm or a tool to find this uh, distinguisher. I classify them into two categories. Some of them are dedicated, based on dedicated algorithms. Uh, there is a nice paper in Crypto 2016 by Patrick Derbers and Fook. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's uh, not only find a distinguisher, but also f can uh, be extended for key recovery, but it's based on a dedicated algorithm. The second category uh, are the tools based on general purpose solvers. Uh, briefly, in this method, in this category, we convert uh, our cryptanalytic problem to a constraint programming problem, and then we use the state of the art constraint programming solvers, MIP solvers, SAS solvers to, use to solve our problem. The advantage of this second uh, type is that we can take advantage of uh, all of the state of the art general purpose solvers. And it's very popular, and mm, as you can see, many previous works have been based on this method. But what is the research gap? Uh, all of these uh, CP-based methods were focused on only finding the distinguisher. Some of them works for impossible differential attacks, some of them works for integral, some work for both integral and zero correlation, but all of them are focused on only finding the distinguisher. And many of them cannot uh, be extended for a unified uh, model for key recovery. But what is the challenge, what is the problem? Uh, many of these works, uh, essentially encode the propagation of differential characteristic uh, through the building blocks of block cipher. They create a constraint programming model which encodes the propagation of differential characteristic. And then they fix the input-output difference. Soon after fixing the input and output difference, you cannot uh, extend your model for key recovery, right? Because in key recovery, we should get rid of this constraint and the input and output of distinguisher. When we want to create an optimization problem, looking for uh, an optimum key recovery attack, we don't like to have constraints on the input and output of distinguisher, right? And these models are based on unsatisfiability of the resulting model. They create a CP model, fix the input and output, and then try to solve the model. If the model is unsatisfiable or impossible, uh, they conclude that, okay, this, this differential transition is impossible. So the limit is that we cannot essentially extend them for key recovery. We fix the input and output difference, okay? The research gap is clear. Let me introduce, with that in mind, let me introduce our method, which is quite simple. And in this method, we get rid of this constraint on the input and output. Uh, it's quite simple. We just divide, assume that we want to find a, we want to create a model, a CSP model, constraint satisfaction problem, to find an impossible differential transition for block cipher E. We divide the block cipher E into two halves. Uh, namely EU and EL, for example. Then we encode the propagation of differential with probability one in forward direction for the first half. We create a constraint satisfaction problem, let's say CSPU, okay? We do the same for the second half, but in the opposite direction. We model the propagation of differences with probability one in backward direction. We create CSPL. They are essentially some constraints and the uh, uh, differences, right? And finally, for the meeting point, we include some new constraints to guarantee the contradiction between these two propagations. That's it. We put all of these constraints together, and when you solve this uh, constraint satisfaction problem, any feasible solution is essentially an impossible differential distinguisher. And there is no constraints on this delta U and this delta L, right? Okay, we get rid of this constraints on the input and, out input and output. This model can be extended for key recovery. Let me uh, recap this section. So the advantage of this method, this very simple method for distinguisher is that it's based on satisfiability. You don't, fade, you don't wait for the unsatisfiable model. You, you create a CSP model, any feasible solution of it is a uh, impossible differential distinguisher and we don't fix the input and output differences, so it can be extended for key recovery. If you can extend your model for key recovery, you can take advantage of some key recovery techniques such as key bridging, meet in the middle technique, you can embed them into your model to take, to take advantage of these techniques.
to find an optimum attack with respect to these techniques. That's the motivation of extending this model for key recovery because we want to automate everything uh, and find a better attack. So uh, that was the distinguisher part, quite easy. Uh, here I, I would like to tell you how we extend the model for key recovery, but before that let me briefly review the basics, of the complexity analysis of impossible differential attack. I don't want to go through the details of complexity analysis, but I would just like to tell you which parameters are effective. When we want to create a CSP model, we should input the effective parameters in the key recovery, right? So the first, um, uh, let's say we need n uh, pairs in our attack, in our key recovery. Uh, so the first step is pair generation, right? To generate these pairs, the complexity essentially depends on the Hamming weight of this delta B and delta F. And in the guess and filter step, uh, the time complexity, which is represented by T1 plus T2 here, depends on the number of actual involved keys, which are represented by KB and KF. Uh, I think it's visible. And uh, the number of bit conditions that we should check when we do partial uh, encryption and decryption, CB and CF. There, there are some, for example, cancellations that we should check when we are doing the guess and filter step. And assume that the probability that a wrong key satisfies this uh, guess and filter step is P. Uh, P depends on the, again, number of pairs that you collect, you have collected, and the number of bit conditions. And finally, the complexity of exhaustive search depends on this probability and the size of key. I don't want to prove these formulas, but as you can see, it's very complicated. For example, the number of pairs appears linearly and exponentially. Imagine you want to find an impossible differential attack using manual approach and take all of these parameters into account. It's very complicated. It's a very complicated combinatorial optimization problem. What we do is essentially extending our model for key recovery. How? We first create a CSP problem, as I explained in the first section, for the distinguisher part. Okay? We model the distinguisher. And then we propagate delta U and delta L with probability 1. When I say we propagate, I mean we put some constraints to model this propagation. We extend our CSP model. It's a still a CSP model. It's not a constraint optimization problem. It's a still a constraint satisfaction problem. And you, this way we encode the number of bit conditions uh, for the, for example, EB and EF for the key recovery parts. They are denoted by CB and CF. And the next step, we model the guess and determine uh, uh, for EB and EF. Uh, I mean, uh, we actually encode the involved key bits. We detect the involved key bits in this module of our model. And the next step, we take the key schedule into account and we consider the relations between these involved keys. Yeah. And finally, we model that those, those complicated complexity formulas in our CSP model. We include all of them in a unified constraint optimization problem, and we put an objective function, which is essentially minimizing the total time complexity. When you solve this constraint optimization problem, what you receive is something uh, like this, the whole attack. But before that, let me show you the usage of our tool. If you look at this tool, this method as a black box, what you need to specify is essentially four integer numbers. The building block of distinguisher, EU and EL, essentially the length of them, which are two integer numbers, four and, for example, 10 and six here, okay? And then you specify the length of key recovery parts and ask the solver, the tool, to find an attack which is optimum with respect to this theoretical framework. Our tool relies on MiniZinc. In MiniZinc, when you want to explain the constraint uh, program uh, problem, um, you, 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 you can use a high-level uh, and solver-independent language, and this tool that compiles your uh, explanation to flattening. And flattening, flattening uh, is essentially understandable by many state-of-the-art uh, CP solvers, SAT solvers and MIT solvers. You can use them. In our work, we used Groovy as a solver, and or tools as the solvers. And yeah, when you run the tool, for example, what you receive as the output is something like this. Uh, the tool gives you the shape of the attack. I shortened the distinguisher in this shape. And all of the critical parameters in key recovery and a rough estimation of complexity, time, memory, and data complexity. 
And it makes the life of Qt analysts really easy because if you have done, uh, I think the impossible differential attack, it's very tedious and time consuming. And yeah, this is again part of our results for Eskini. Uh, I should mention that uh, this method uh, is applicable for integral attack and zero correlation attack. And as you can see, uh, we got a series of significantly improved results. Another interesting application was that uh, when, we was, when we were trying to uh, reproduce the previous results in previous papers, uh, we found some flaws. Uh, we didn't uh, do it intentionally. We wanted to check the correctness of our tool. And some parameters of our tool are uh, variables, right? Uh, for example, data, time, and memory complexity. These are variables in our model. Uh, when someone claims an attack with this time complexity and memory and data complexity and use the same framework, we, okay, we put, we fix these variables in our model and we run the model. If the model returns unsatisfiable, there should be something wrong with the attack. And when we try to <laughs> actually reproduce the previous results, we notice that some of the previous works have a serious flaw, which makes their attack invalid. This was just a uh, uh, side effect of our tool. And yeah, thanks for your time. And I would like to finish with just pointing to some future work. So someone can apply our method to other ciphers such as AES, Montes, and Karma. Another uh, future work could be creating the bit-oriented version of our tool because our tool is word-oriented. Uh, someone can create a bit-oriented version of this tool and apply it to some semi-aligned ciphers such as GIFT and PRESENT or ASCON. And another approach or, or a future work could be improving the key recovery part of our C, uh, model for Z, zero correlation and integral attack. Because um, for zero correlation and integral attacks, for example, we didn't consider some uh, key recovery techniques such as partial sum techniques. If someone embed or include these techniques in our model, it is still possible to improve the previous attacks. Thanks for your time. Let's take the, the time for one question, if so. Thanks. Thank you again, and thank you to all the speakers of this session.